morning, everybody. Welcome to Greenhouse. Would you stand to your feet and open up your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 16? I want to give a massive shout out to everybody that is down in South Florida right now. What is up, everybody? Greenhouse family down there. Can we make some noise right here for our family right down there? Man, we are in this Believe series. I'm so glad to be joining you guys right now. Pastor John was talking last week about this in-between period. We're about to jump back in it today, and we're going to go at it. Everyone that's over Kanapa Hall, what is up as well? Welcome today. Uh, and if you're in Auditorium A, you're joining us online somewhere. God bless you. I hope you're ready for this. Uh, this series that we're in that's called Believe, could we just say that word together? Believe. Believe. I mean, more than probably any sermon series we have ever had, I feel as if this is like a prophetic movement for us of saying, hey, church, we really are called to believe. You are wired to believe. You are wired to thrive when you believe God. So today I'm just praying that your faith is going to get stirred in a deeper way. Are you guys ready for this? Let's do this. Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Is anyone freaking out right about now in this story? <laughs> I don't know about you. And he went into Hagar... And she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave you my servant for you to embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant's in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. By the way, that's the same phrase that was used uh, later in, of the Egyptians, when the Egyptians dealt harshly with the Israelites. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring of the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. That'd be hard. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called, on the, she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. I want to talk today about the impatience of unbelief. And there are some of you that are listening to me right now that are right on the verge of an Ishmael, and I'm supposed to stop you today and say, wait. I want you to wait Look at the person next to you. Say, wait. Wait. The impatience of unbelief. Let's pray. Father, help. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So last week we talked about the trouble that we have with waiting on God. And the trouble that we have when we get in this in-between period. So many of you know, my wife on November the 1st was hit by a Mack truck, and so she's been uh, in a wheelchair, she was in the hospital, all of that, and so a few weeks ago she got out, and, and we act actually got to go to Disney World for a few, there was like a $120 deal for a four-day Disney World thing, we went there, and she was able to make it three or four hours, and we had to leave after that, but I remember being at Disney World, and it was particularly uh, busy, I don't know if any of you enjoy standing in lines, but we were at Disney World, standing in line, and I'm, I was next to somebody, and as they're describing, they were talking to someone, they said, I can't believe this, 
the plane flight was late. I get here late. We got in late. We weren't able to get to the early. You know, you can show up, I guess, early, and you get there before all the peons do, like if you're staying at one of the resorts or something. And, and so every, but everything was late. And then they, they said, I've had to stay in, in line, you know, in all these lines, and something went wrong with their fast pass. And they said, I'm having to stand in line with everyone that didn't get a fast pass. And, and then they said, this is the worst day of my life. And, I, and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, oh, you who got on a big metal vehicle that let you fly in the air like a bird across the world, and you're standing in line surrounded by Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy, and this is the worst day of your life? This is the worst day of their life. And then they weren't getting a signal on their cell phone. They said, now my cell phone's not getting a signal. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just, I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself, what has happened to humans? I was reading a study this week that said when you download videos, they say that they just did a study with 7 million viewers of, of uh, online videos, and they say at two seconds, people start checking out. So if they try to load a video, after two seconds, people start checking out. They're like, forget it, I'm closing this thing. After like four seconds, it's, by the time you hit seven seconds, if it takes seven seconds to load the video, half of the people that are watching it cut it off because they cannot wait any longer. The whole world that we live in right now is amazing, and yet nobody is happy because, because of this, this weight. See, see, there's so much at stake. We said last week that what God does is he makes promises. God will make a promise. In fact, God has made a lot of promises. The problem is, in between the promises and the fulfillment, in the fulfillment of these promises, is this, as John would say, in this in-between period, we, we call this this gap. There is this gap in between the promise and the fulfillment. And where we find Abram this week is where this gap, this in-between period takes place. And it's fine if the in-between period is like 30 minutes or less like a Domino's pizza. It's fine when the gap is, is taking a few months maybe. But when the gap is, is going on and on and on, when you reach the gap and when God spoke years ago but he hasn't said something recently, when the, when the gap becomes long and the wait becomes torturous, there becomes this tendency in us that becomes very, very impatient. When we've been delayed, Delayed, we start not just to doubt the promises, but we begin to doubt the person of these promises because the delay is taking so long. So what we're finding Abram right now is Abram is something like 10 years into waiting. The last thing he's heard is that there's offspring are going to come, and yet the offspring haven't yet come. And here is what's at stake today. When the promises are delaying, you will get tempted to take matters into your own hands. When the promises delay, there is such a temptation, there is such a tendency. Listen, Kanapaha, there is such a, a proclivity that we humans have to say, God, I know you made some promises. Perhaps you need me to help you fulfill your promises. And I need to make sure all of us know something very clearly here. God is not slow but neither is he in a hurry. God is not slow, but neither is he in a hurry. And that's our dilemma today. So today, where I want to go with this is when you get tempted, all I'm going to try to say today is this. When you are tempted to take matters into your own hands, wait. First, this is point number one today. Wait. All I'm saying right now is wait. When to Abram, when no baby has come and Hagar's right in front of you, wait. There are some of you right now, you're on the verge of purchasing an Ishmael. You're on the verge of producing an Ishmael. You're on the verge of getting in a relationship called Ishmael. You're on the verge of doing something in the flesh that God only meant to be done by his spirit. And when you are, wait. Point number one, wait. Mike, I feel like I can't wait. When you, when you think you can't wait, you know it's not God. That's the quickest point I ever made. That was point number one. Point number two. What do I do after I wait? Point number two. Cling to the promises. 
Cling to the promises. Look at verse 1 here. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now God had promised children. Have you ever felt like, you ever had this feeling like where there were promises and someone brings up the promises and it's like, man, don't open that wound. I mean, I, I mentioned, I've mentioned before how, how the promises, like one person told me, Mike, the promises, I don't like the promises of God because they get my hopes up and I don't want my hopes to get up. I mean, Abram's name is Abram. It means exalted father. He's basically been living a cosmic joke for the first seven decades of his life. Everywhere he walks, his name in Hebrew is Exalted Father. Hello, Exalted Father. He's had no children. Hello, Exalted Father. Can you imagine your name is Exalted Father, and he's not an Exalted Father? It'd be like if someone named you Celine Dion and you can't sing. You're like, why'd you name me Celine? You know what I mean? It'd be like, why did you just do that? That makes no sense to me. His name is exalted for 70-something years. He's had no kids, and he's the exalted father. He's like the butt of jokes when he leaves the room. And then God comes to him in his 70s and says, I'm giving you a promise. You're going to have not just a child. You're going to have children, not just children. There's going to be multitudes, not just multitudes. Count the stars if you can. Man, friends, the promises of God are the, the lascivious nature of the promises of God offend our sensibilities. You ever had your hopes up on something? I mean, I can imagine you wanted kids when you're 30 and when you're 40 and when you're 50, but now you're 70 and now God makes the promise and he gets his hopes up. It's almost like you can imagine him saying, you know what, I've already died to that. I've already accepted the fact that I'm never going to have a kid. I've already acquiesced to the cruelty of life. God, what are you doing getting my hopes up after I've just settled into an existence that might not be wonderful and blessed, but at least it's bearable. And what are you getting my hopes up for? Abraham's now about 85 years old. A decade's gone by. And now in chapter 16, when, when a decade has passed, when he believed and it was counted to him as righteousness, and yet the promises have still not come true, you've got to start to question. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever said this? Lord, did I hear you right? Lord, did I get this right? Was that my imagination? I'm, I'm here in the gap now. I still have no children. I'm 10 years in. Did I get this right? There's still no kids. There's still no signs. Was that just me talking? Was that wishful thinking? Did I think I heard God, but it wasn't really God? It was just me because my name's Exalted Father. After all, all my life when someone said, what's your name? And I said, Exalted Father. And they're like, oh, well, where's all the children? Well, there aren't any. Well, you're not very exalted. I mean, all the times I've gone through this, in my life, I've, I've already died to that, and now here I am. Lord, did I get it right? Did I, have I done something wrong? Have you ever done that when the promises aren't coming true? Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe there's something deficient in me. Maybe there's something about me that, that just, just isn't right that's, that's stopping this. Or, or maybe God expects something of me that I haven't yet done. You know what it says in Proverbs 13, 12? It's an interesting one. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. What an interesting thing. You know, in Chinese, the, they, they join two characters to form a single pictograph for the word busyness. It's the word heart and killing. And you bring those together, and it's this word like hurry or a rush. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so something comes in your mind when you're living in the gap. Why study when I could cheat and get the same result? Why save up for that couch when I can charge it and I can get it today? Why save up for a car when that's going to take a little while when I could, just, I could just charge that thing and be making you know, $640 payments you know, today? When I could, I could go home with that thing today and it will smell so new. Nothing like a new car. Why, why wait for the original ideas when I could plagiarize in a way that nobody would find out and I could just sort of take some matters into my own hands? Why take the time to talk it out with that loved one or that friend when I could get immediate relief of this frustration by leaving the room right now? Why sit here and go through? I already know my wife's going to, oh, my wife wants me to talk through this. Oh, I already know my kids want to conversate. 
my roommate, my, my talkative roommate, my verbose roommate wants to talk it through. Why talk it through when I could just, just go ahead and get, why wait until I'm married for my sexuality when we're already going to be married anyway? And in God, who's eternal, he doesn't see time. So in his eyes, maybe we are married already. So why wait? And I already love her and she already loves me. So we might as well because why? See, so there's all, it, when you get in the gap, there's such a temptation to settle for the shortcuts. Shortcuts look so good. And when that comes, number one, wait. Number two, cling to the promises. Look at verse two. It says, Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. It's amazing that when you get in the gap, and when you are in the gap, when you're in that in-between, and you've been waiting, it is amazing the voices that will call into question the goodness of God. It's not just I haven't had a child. It's the Lord has present, prevented me from having a child. See, when what you expect does not happen, when you expect, you get impatient. And watch, when you get impatient, you go into the realm of anti-faith. Let me be clear. Faith is patient. I want us as a church family to believe. I want you to know that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that if God has said it, it shall come to pass. What God announces, he performs. Can I get an amen? If God says it, it is going to happen. Let me tell you what that God has not said. He hasn't said when. He has said it will happen. A big part of faith is faith is patient. Faith means waiting. Faith means I, in the middle of that gap of the in-between time, I believe that God, I believe I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And see, when you get impatient, you go into the realm of anti-faith. And you need to know that God is not slow, but he is also not in a hurry. Let me read you a few scriptures just to kind of tether this point. In James chapter 1, uh, everyone's very favorite verse when you're going through a hard time. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces... You know that the testing of your faith produces. When you're in the gap, it produces. Why does God have these gaps? Because gaps produce. The in-between produces. The waiting period produces what instant gratification does not. Why does God want us to wait till we get married? Because waiting till you get married produces something that not waiting till you're married does not. Why does God want me to wait to buy that house until I can afford it. Because waiting to buy the house until you can afford it produces something that not waiting does not. Because when you wait, there is a way in which, well, see what this says? But let steadfastness or patience, let it have its full effect. What? Let it have its full effect. The fu in other words, if God has a period of time between here and here, and he knows what's up, can we all say he knows what's up? This means that when you are in this moment right here, if God's ordained for you to make it all the way to here, let it have its full effect. Do you know how many people quit a few feet before the full effect? Can we all just say, don't? What was point number one? Wait. How do you say that in Spanish? It's better. How do you say that in Creole? That's correct, all right? That's right. How do you say it in Russian? Wait. And then cling to the promise. He says it's going to have its full effect. There is a full effect that it's going to have. Uh, over in Hebrews chapter 6, look at this. In verse 12, it says, Do not be sluggish, but be, you must not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit what? Through faith and impatience, inherit the promises. God makes the promises. One day there will be those that inherit the promises. And who are those who inherit the promises? Those who by faith. We See, what some people think is all you need is faith. You do need faith, but faith has this wonder twin called patience. God hasn't spoken in the last 24 hours. God hasn't moved in the last. See, there's something, about the, there's something about when you seem to be getting the silent treatment. Let me just be clear, you're not. God speaks at frequencies that you don't always detect when he's speaking them. 
God is moving in ways that you don't always detect when he's moving. Through faith and patience. How about this? 1 Peter chapter 5. Can you put that up there? 1 Peter 5, 6. It says, humble yourselves. See, the problem with waiting is it's humbling. It's humbling. This week, I went, we had some uh, uh, missionaries that were in Gainesville from another city. And so they came here to do this. And I said, man, I'm just going to go treat them all to Chick-fil-A. And so I, well, I don't want to say the name of the restaurant. Um, so I, I was going to go to this restaurant. <laughs> and I showed up at this restaurant. I'll remember that next service. And I showed up at this restaurant, an unnamed restaurant. And I... I, I said, could I please get a, like 25 chicken biscuits? And they were like, whoa. And, and someone freaked out. And they're like, that's going to be like 35 minutes to an hour. I'm like, 35 minutes to an hour for chicken biscuits? Like that's like, that's like two chicken two minutes per chicken biscuit. I said, if it's going to be like two minutes per chicken biscuit, the chicken biscuit needs to jump in my lap and lick my face. I'm like, I, I can't wait that long. And, and, and they were kind of freaking out. And all of a sudden, I realized because I had my, my stuff with me, and I was sort of getting ready for this weekend, and, and I was just reading about this. I just read this. For, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. But what I was wanting, I wanted to be exalted to my chicken biscuits instantly. <laughs> because if, I'm gonna t- if it's going to take 35 minutes to an hour for food, I'll go to Flying Biscuit. <laughs> That's where I'll go. Not Chicken Biscuit, all right? I'm not, that's not, I'm not going to fast food for not fast food, right? And so I'm sitting there, and, I'm, and, and the person kind of looked at me, and I don't know why, I just, I was so convicted of, like, that sense of, there's the, have you ever been in a line, and you didn't want to wait, and, and it's, and everything you're telling them is like, do you know who I am? I'm a child of God, you know? <laughs> Kings cannot wait for such thing, you know? The, it's sort of in, like that kind of, that's not what you say. But it is what you're saying. And she, so she handed me like a little thing. She's like, could you take this and wait? And I'm like, I, I guess I have no choice. And by the time I went and sat down and I had my Bible, with my, I opened my Bible and I read this, I'm like, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> How embarrassing, Jesus. Look at this. Humble yourself. This is what it said. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, by the way, this, this proper time, it's the word kairos. So there's like a couple different words in Greek for like time. One, one would be chronos, like chronological time. You're looking at the clock, you know, there, it's 10 o'clock and then it's 11 o'clock and then it's 12 o'clock. But then there's kairos. The idea of kairos time is that kairos time is, it's like an appointed time. It's, it's a proper time. It's, it's a God-ordained kind of time. So one of the problems that I face is that I've been discipled in a world that has trained me to tell time by chronos clocks, but I serve a God who lives in heaven who does appointments by a kairos clock. I don't know when the kairos clock is because I'm so addicted to a chronos clock that gets me annoyed at a gap, but when angels in, heavens are, angels in heaven are watching what's taking place on the earth, earth and they're looking at a kairos clock they're like oh children of god do you not see what this gap is about to produce do you not see south florida what the in between does to your soul when the when just the right time comes he's going to lift you what does it say that he may exalt you humble yourself abram humble yourself exalted father therefore under the mighty hand of god exalted father so that at the proper time exalted father he may exalt you It's amazing how we want to take our exaltation into our own hands. But verse 3 says, And Abram, Abram, he, verse 2 says, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, he took Hagar the Egyptian. She she takes him, and and verse 4, he went into Hagar and she conceived. She took and gave. This is Adam and Eve all over again. This is like straight out of the book of Genesis chapter you know, 2 and 3 when Eve took the forbidden fruit and gave. The, the author is playing with us. He's giving us the very clear, she took Hagar, like plucked her from a tree, and she gave. By the way, the same Hagar, very likely that they picked up along the way when they went to Egypt on an ill-fated visit earlier when he goes in and he says, hey, uh, you know, go ahead and, I mean, if you're having a hard time with Sarai saying, go ahead and sleep with Hagar. Well, Abram's already been there. He's like, oh, to save my life, when they went to Egypt, he said, go ahead and sleep with my wife. So this is the same, you can see 
see what kind of is going on here. There's something's got to get produced. See, the problem of, with us is it's not just Abram. It's not just Adam. All of us have slept with Hagar. All of us have plucked the fruit from the tree. And the Bible says in verse 4, Hagar conceived. She, she conceived. And this is the temptation of the shortcut. When you're in the midst of the valley, when you are in the midst of the weight, there is the temptation to take matters into your own hands and to say, I can do this without God. Abram, why won't you wait for Sarai? Because for me to wait for Sarai, it would have to be a miracle. And I don't want to have to wait for a miracle. I don't want it to have to be God. I've, I've been raised in a culture that says, God helps those who help themselves. Micah Zaiah 4.1. And there is no such verse. And there is no such book. Although I think it'd be cool. There is no Bible verse that says God helps those who help themselves. God seems to only help those who reach the point that know that they cannot help themselves. And that's offensive. That's offensive when you are a go-getter. That's offensive if you're an entrepreneur. That's offensive if you're in charge. That's offensive if you're a manager. That's offensive if you're a homo sapien. Hagar conceived. See, to wait for God is awfully hard. And so we see what happens here. It says that, uh, it says that she looked with contempt. She gets pregnant. This, this slave from Egypt gets pregnant, and she looks with contempt. In other words, she gets puffed up. And for some unknown reason, this servant, who is going to be used as a surrogate, when she gets pregnant, she gets cocky. She gets arrogant. She starts flaunting it in her mistress's face. Sarai, who's not been able to have a baby all of her life, all of a sudden now, she's doing the whole nanny nanny boo boo you can't do what I can do. And she's doing this, and of course we see what happens. Sarai says, Abram, may the wrong uh, be done, that's been done to me, may it be on you. I gave you my servant. So, so Hagar isn't real virtuous because she gets the one thing she's got. She throws in her you know, mistress's face. Sarai is about to become abusive. And what does Abram do? Abram takes his hands off. He's just like completely neutral. Behold, your servant's in your power. Do to her as whatever you want to do. He just like, he's totally hands off of this as if he's done nothing in the whole deal. See, there's something about it that when we, listen, you can take matters into your own hands. And I hear people say this a lot. You know what? God has already told me, whatever I choose, he will bless. Indeed, we're going to read that God's going to promise to bless even Ishmael. What I'm telling you is some of you are on the verge of creating an Ishmael, and I'm supposed to tell you, wait, stop, cling to the promises of God. When they seem like they are tarrying too long, cling to the promises of God. Of God. See, we read this story right now, and we hear about Sarai saying, take my servant Hagar and sleep with her to get a baby, and we are like 10 out of 10 disgusted by this. Like, I cannot believe she would do this. But do you understand that in their culture, in, con- in, the- in that time, this was called conventional wisdom. In fact, it was in like a lot of codes of, the a- of antiquity, where people would go, and they couldn't have a baby, so they would get a servant, and they would say, you go have a baby, and it will be basically credited to me. I will raise that child as my own. And so this was a very conventional, this isn't something they just came up with. This is something they had seen done many, many, many times. So if you've ever been in the in-between waiting gap period, and God seems to be taking way too long, your friends will start to tell you, go and do what seems natural, because God helps those who help themselves. And you, you, know, you, can't, uh, you can't steer a, 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 you know, a, a car that's not moving, and so you've got to get this thing going. And so you know, go ahead, Abram, let's go ahead and get this little thing done you got to help God do his work. Now, I just want to make it real clear. God does not need your help. He wants your cooperation, but he doesn't need your help, and he doesn't need, your, he doesn't need you to use the flesh to try to do what he has promised to do in spirit. Stop trying to use the resources of earth to do what God has promised from heaven. And there's trouble to his marriage. There's trouble to his wife. There's trouble to the servant, and ultimately there will be trouble to the world because we now live in a world where thousands of years later, indeed, the son of Sarai and the son of Hagar are still at war today. See, Egypt 
all through Scripture is, is not just the way of anti-faith, it's the way of conventional wisdom. And I just want to let you know, you don't need to go with conventional wisdom, you need to go with God. Stop being surprised, I need you to catch this, stop being surprised when the earth realm doesn't meet all your needs. The temptation for you when you are in the gap, the temptation is to just live natural. Hagar can give you a child naturally. You can swipe that card and you can charge that purchase and you can get it naturally. You can walk out of the room and Avoid the pain naturally. Stop living naturally is what the scripture says. You aren't just natural. You're not just flesh and blood. You're not just a a physical being. You are a spirit. There is another part of you. Stop acting like the only realm is earth. There is another realm. It is called heaven. And the life of faith means we don't act as if there is no heaven. We recognize that Jesus said, I'm praying that it will be on earth as it is in heaven. See, faith is about on earth as it is in heaven. That's what faith is. Faith is when you realize, wait a minute, I'm in the gap, and the promises aren't coming true, but that's right. Wait, wait, wait. Heaven operates by a different clock than Kronos, and heaven has a whole other set of resources other than Hagar's. You don't need to use Hagar, baby. You've got heaven. See, the temptation is to live naturally, but you are more than natural. And as long as you're trying to meet your needs by natural and by sight, you will never be satisfied because inside of you is the image of God. And being made in the image of God, you have an appetite for the supernatural. There is a part of you that will never be satisfied with the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life and the possessions of this earth. Because when you get another mansion, when you get the best car, when you get another invention, when you get another business, when you get another, you fill in the blank, when you attain another a milestone, it's still never going to do it because this earth doesn't have it in it to please you in the deepest parts because you are a body, but you are a spirit and there's something inside of you that only gets met by the things of God himself. Don't you know that? Doesn't something inside of you say it's true? Cling to the promises. Abram, how do, I, how do I access this? If, if I'm more than just, I, I want to stir you up. You are more than natural. If you belong to Jesus, your spirit has come alive. You have a spirit in you. There is a spirit in you that craves things other than sugar and coffee. There is a spirit in you. Mike, how do I access that? Put that up there. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Talking about the promises, it says this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. His divine power has granted to us. Part of your faith means you need to know this. He's already given you what you need. A lot of us are praying for what God's already given. God, I need you to give me some stuff. He's like, I have. Lord, I pray you bless me. He says, I have. No, I need you to bless me some more. I bless you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The problem is when you're looking for the blessings on earth, the way God does blessings is he blesses you with every blessing in the heavenly places. And then when you bring it to the place where you start living and praying on earth as it is in heaven, you will begin to release on the earth the things that God has given you in heaven. This is great news. If you've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, the book of Ephesians says, you have been blessed with every. Can Apaha say every? South Florida, say every. Auditory May, say every. How many blessings have you been blessed with? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But Mike, I'm living on earth. No, you're living on earth and in the heavenly places, which is why Jesus said, pray, it will be on earth as it is in heaven, which means it's like me saying to you right now, there's a bank that you've got and all the stuff is in the bank. You're like, yeah, but it's not in my house. I know, but it's at the bank. So go to the bank. And if you've got good technology, you'll start to figure out how to access the bank through your smartphone. Some of us need to be able to know that when you're walking down on your everyday life in the middle of a meeting, you've got access to heaven, even if you're you're in a meeting with a demonic boss at your job. You can say, I've got access. Yes, you've got a smartphone. What is it? 1-800-GET-ON-YOUR-KNEES and pray. You have access to the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus that when we, you call upon me, I'll be near you. You hold on to the promises. He said, look at this. This is just amazing. He says, his divine power has granted to us all things. How many? All things that pertain to life and godliness. What? I I knew he gave me all things that pertain to godliness and life and life. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Man, I got a big deal to close this week. He's given you something that pertains to that. Man, there's a girl that I want to ask out. I think she might be my wife. He's given you promises that, that pertain to that. 
He has? Yes. What verse? I'll tell you later. <laughs> My wife and I want to have children, but we haven't been able to have children yet. He's, he's given you things that pertain to having children. I just got a cancer report. What should I do about that? He's given you things that pertain to that. Well, what things does he give? Watch, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great, what? Promises. His precious and very great promises. The promises that, what do we do with that? Watch this. That through them, through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Mike, I'm in the gap, and the fulfillment hasn't happened yet. What am I going to do? You wait, and then you cling to the promises, because through them, you become partakers of the divine nature. God has got Kronos. God has got Kairos. Kronos on earth. Up in heaven, you can have all of the above. I've got a limited life on earth. There is an unlimited reality in heaven. I've got limits on earth. On earth, my peace is determined by my circumstances. In heaven, my peace is determined not by my circumstances, but by my Savior. So when I'm on the earth in my Kronos time, and it's ticking me off, I've got access through the promises to a God who has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I've got access now to go into Kairos time where Kairos can intercept my chronos and the promises of God can intercept my, my circumstances. And a man that's got no reason to have peace all of a sudden has peace. And a world looks at people that are living in the gap and says, why would a human possibly have peace when you've got a cancer report? Don't you know they say you've got six chronos to live and you say chronos I've got a kairos. You know, circumstances, I've got a savior. Peace, my peace is not determined by my gap or the length of the fulfillment. My peace is determined by the God who has spoken. Don't you see? Through, through them, that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. How do I access this more than natural life? Through them. See, it is against, if you belong to Jesus, it is against your nature to not have an appetite for the supernatural. It is against your nature to not have an appetite for the impossible. See, he wants to bring, bring his kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven, but he wants to demonstrate it through you, through me. That's what he longs to do. He has said, I'm never going to leave you. That's a promise. He has said, you will overcome. It's a promise. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No weapon that's formed against you is going to prosper. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's what the Bible says. I just went ahead and this morning, I just posted on my blog some little uh, scripture confessions that sometimes I'll go through. I, would, I, I dare you to become an expert at the promises of God. If the pathway to the power of heaven on earth is the, via these promises in some way, baby, get, become an expert at the promises. Know the promises. Are you afraid? There are promises. Are you lustful? There are promises. Are you, are you uh, nervous? There are promises. Are you feeling antsy? There are promises. Are you confused? There are promises. Are you sick? There are promises. Are you on a mountaintop? There are promises. And through them, you will become a partaker of the divine nature. That means in some way, you who have been made in the image of God, you are not God. There is one God. He is not you. But he has marked you. His image is on you. And he has made you to do the kind of stuff he does. You want a promise? Here's one. Greater works than I do will you do, says Jesus. What is that? It's a promise. Well, I haven't seen that happen yet. Well, you can either throw in the towel and go ahead and say peace out to the promises, or you can cling to these promises, and even in the middle of the gap, you can have heaven invade earth, and even before the fulfillment happens, you'll find out there was something deeper going on than just you getting the fulfillment God was getting you. It feels like there, there's more than this. Than, no, there is, and, and this is, see, see, number one, wait. Everyone say wait. When you're tempted to go make a flesh child, wait. Number two, cling to the promises. If you haven't made a list of promises, make them. When you're reading the scriptures this week, every time you find a promise, maybe put a big P up there and circle the P. P. Oh, that's a promise. Oh, that was a promise right there. I just got myself a, a promise. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, Isaiah 26. What? That's a promise. That's a promise. 
Ask, and it will be given to you. What? That's a promise. Number three. But Abram said to Sarai, do whatever you want. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found this woman, Hagar. It's weird. What is Hagar doing in the middle of the story? She's all wrong. She's an Egyptian. It's not a story about Egyptians. It's a story about the, the people, the elect people of God. She, she's a woman in a man's world. She's a servant. She's all wrong. What's this woman who's all wrong doing in this story? Do we have any all wrong people in the room right now? Anyone in South Florida? Can I, any all wrong people? Go and submit. She says, go back and submit. You're going to have to trust me. See, see here's the thing. If, if all we do is, is wrestle with the promises, it's never going to be enough. See, number one, you've got to wait. When you're, when you're tempted to take matters into your own hands, wait. This week, when you're tempted to take matters into your own hands, wait. Cling to the promises. Cling to the promises. But this is where it gets humanized because you've got to surrender to the person. It, it's not enough to cling to the promises. You're going to have to surrender to the person. And, and the angel of the Lord shows up and starts talking to her. And, and the angel of the Lord, this is the pre-incarnate Christ, most likely, said to her, return to your mistress and submit. What? And the angel of the Lord also said to her, now the angel of the Lord hasn't even spoken to Sarai. And the angel of the Lord is speaking directly to a woman, to a servant woman in a male's world, in a Jewish line. I will surely multiply your offspring." So that they cannot be, I'm going to multiply your offspring. He's telling her, and the angel of the Lord said to her a third time. He keeps on talking to her. Man, God speaks to people that don't deserve to be spoken to. She's not just an Egyptian. She's also arrogant. She's, she's running because she's also arrogant. She's puffed up. She's cocky. And now she's crushed, and he meets her in her crushed place. Behold, you're pregnant, and you will bear a son, and you'll call his name Ishmael. I'm even going to tell you, it's going to be a boy. The whole world's going to wonder forever and ever and ever, you know, is it a boy, is it a girl? I'm going to tell you in advance, it's going to be a boy. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction. I was talking to someone this week, and they said, you know, I've been wrestling with the difference between asking God for specific things, like from his promises. When you ask God for specific things, but also surrendering my dreams and my desires. It's a very strange place to be. Surrendering sometimes feels like doubt. But if you listen, you can hear God saying, Praying in faith is believing. I will do it. Surrender is trusting me with how and when I will do it. Let me be creative. Faith is a declaration of God's power and God's ability and God's might and God's strength. But surrender is a declaration of his sovereignty and his lordship over my life. Faith is where I lay hold of the positional reality of who I am and what God says about my future. Surrender speaks to the relationship that I have with the Lord. That's why I often feel odd when I pray without acknowledging that God is a good and gracious Father whose ways are higher than I can imagine. So on one hand, when you're praying, if all you do is take the promises like these, these uh, rights that you have and you throw them in God's face like... You better give me this because don't you know? And when you throw, there's something feels weird about that when you don't recognize God is good. Can I say it, church? God is good. He is gracious. He is a gracious Father who loves you deeply. But it's why I also feel weird when I start to come over here and I pray too much like, well, if it's God's will, when God has already spoken what his will is. When you do too much of the praying like, well, Lord, if it's your will, we pray for healing. And if it's your will, I pray that I'm not going to go broke. And if it's your will, I pray that my children don't poke each other in the eyeballs and if it's your will and, and all this and you don't see anywhere in the bible where people are walking around like well i'm going to listen to your promises then i'm going to go back and pray if it's your will will you keep your promise what are you saying i'm saying there is this beautiful tension where you are supposed to pray in faith when you see the promises because the promises are yes and amen but you don't just pray with faith you also come with surrender because you don't know when and you don't know how you just know who Paul says in Timothy, I know whom I have believed. See, faith is not just a what, it's a whom. 
It's a home. See, see, the angel of the Lord shows up to this this servant that's on the run. And she called. She didn't just call on the name. Look at this, 613. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. This servant nobody has named the Lord, and it made it into Scripture. And even now, I praise the God who sees. See, friends, do you know what faith is? Faith is when you know the promises are going to come true, but you don't know how it's going to come true. You don't know when it's going to come true, but you know through whom it's going to come true. See, faith is not just to what it's, if you're sitting right now in a spring of affliction, maybe you are pregnant, maybe someone listening to me right now is alone, maybe there's a woman here that's got an unplanned pregnancy, maybe there's someone watching online, and you're in a spot you wish you were not in, and all of the evidence of your life seems to say that you have been abandoned, this is where faith gets proved genuine when it's in the gap. Maybe we've got a brother or sister that's here right now, and you're listening, and you feel like God has been silent, but right now, when the people are looking at two pieces of evidence and over on one side all you've got is your circumstance and all on the other side all you've got are the promises and it's choosing between do I go with circumstance or do I go with the promises your mind and your heart are the jury and the question is who is going to win the battle and when it comes down to the closing argument it's won by the character witness of God himself Who has made the promise? It's the Lord who sees. It's the Lord who sees. I I think it's incredible. It says, and the angel of the Lord found her. She's been getting beaten by her mistress, so she runs. She's going to die. She's on her way back to Egypt. And the angel of the Lord found her. I find it stunning that God is so good at finding people that weren't even looking for him. I find it stunning that he speaks to people that weren't even speaking to him. I find it stunning that she would name him and say, you saw me. Does anybody see me? Because he has made a promise that he's going to watch for you and he's going to see you and he's going to find you if you'll let him. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're in South Florida. Maybe you're in Kanapaha. Maybe you're in Auditorium A, and you've not been found. Let him find you today. Let him find you. How, how could he do that? See, she, she could be seen by him because one day Jesus was going to be on a cross, and Jesus would be able to go on a cross to get all the people that don't deserve to be looked at and to be looked at. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. When he was on the cross, you were on his heart. All the Hagars and all the Sarais and all the Abrams, in case you haven't caught it in this story yet, the only hero of the story is God. Sarai's not virtuous. Abram's not virtuous. Hagar's not virtuous. And yet God comes and finds them all because they believed. So why don't you believe? If you're about to make a disastrous decision, wait. Maybe you need to go home and become an expert at some of these promises. But maybe today's the day to surrender to the person. Pastor John, I want you to come and call people to believe in South Florida. Danley, I want you to call people to believe in Al Torme. Joel, Joel over in Kanapaha right now, I want you to come and call people to believe. And all of you that are here right now, maybe some of you need to surrender and submit to the angel of the Lord today. Maybe there's some of you that it would be hard for you to go back and submit. He's going to take care of her. Hagar is going to get taken care of. God was not justifying abuse. You don't hear of any more abuse taking place. When you submit to God, God has a way of taking things and making them right. And Hagar got a blessing. They're a blessing. They're a blessing. They're a blessing.